rock okay. and roll. All right, so let us get going. Okay. Um, well, let, let me do a quick introduction first. So, uh, welcome everyone. We're um, very happy you could be here today. We just uh, we just pushed out jQuery 1.4. Uh, not even like an hour, hour and a half ago. And uh, so we're very happy that you could be here today. Um, we have a nice little selection of uh, the jQuery team here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I'm John Rezig. I'm the creator of jQuery. We have Yehuda Katz, um, who's also on the Rails core team. Uh, we have Scott Gonzalez, who's on the jQuery UI team. And we have Paul Irish, uh, who will be joining the jQuery team very, very soon. Um, so, um, we uh, hope you have uh, lots of questions. If you could submit them, probably the easiest is to submit them to Google Moderator. Uh, but if you are also on the IRC channel, um, again, that's a webchat.freenode.net, and you join uh, jQuery 1.4. Um, so, yeah, if you have uh, any questions, we will try to answer them as best as we can. Okay, so let's start off. Um, I'm just going to hit up some of these uh, questions coming in on, on Google Moderator. Uh, top question at the moment. What should I be on the lookout for if I replace my 1.3 jQuery with 1.4? What could break? So at the very minimum, um, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about uh, API changes in that uh, if you were using some methods that were in jQuery 1.3, they're still going to be there. Uh, we've maintained all the methods uh, that were there, and we haven't uh, explicitly removed anything. All, all, all the public methods, we haven't uh, explicitly removed anything. Um, so to watch out for, we, we provided a list of things that we think may po possibly cause problems for somebody somewhere. Um, uh, granted that there all the changes that we made, we uh, tried to minimize uh, the chance of, uh, of potential problems. So if you look at the release notes uh, that came out a little while ago, uh, you can see um, a list at the very bottom uh, under upgrading, or sorry, under uh, ba backwards incompatibilities. And you can see all the possible uh, bits of weirdness. Um, one that um, I think might cause a little bit of problems, so the uh, if you call jQuery with no arguments, um, uh, there was a little bit of confusion surrounding it. So what we did was, um, if you called just jQuery passing in no arguments, historically it would return a set with a document in it. And we changed it to actually just return an empty set, which makes more sense. Um, one of the cases where that's used most frequently is in the ready events. I've seen people do an empty jQuery and then dot ready. That still works. And um, uh, we made sure that that still worked. However, if you've been doing uh, like an empty jQuery dot bind or dot trigger, uh, those will stop working. And you should start using jQuery document explicitly. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, but as far as changes, I would definitely recommend checking out that list. It's, it's probably, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than willing to bet that uh, you're probably not going to encounter uh, any major issues. Was uh, the the JSON parsing um, did that get resolved? So um, one one change that we made is that if you um, so like uh, if you're g uh, getting JSON via AJAX, um, we now strictly enforce that uh, the JSON that's coming in is proper JSON. Um, we had to do this because we are now using the native JSON uh, parser uh, provided by browsers. And the only way in which we could do that is we had to guarantee that uh, the same results are going to be coming in uh, uh, no matter what. So um, if you were passing around malformed JSON and expecting it to still parse, you will get uh, a parser error now. Um, so that's, that may cause some problems for people who are, parsing, who are passing around malformed JSON. But um, theoretically, if you're doing everything right, then it'll continue to work. Uh, how much smaller and faster would jQuery be if uh, IE6 support was dropped? Um, so if, if we dropped only IE6, uh, nothing would change. Um, there, I don't, we don't have any jQuery, we don't have any bugs that we're tackling or any, anything that we're tackling in jQuery that isn't also an issue in IE7. Um, if we dropped IE6 and IE7, um, we could probably get, we could probably remove the selector engine, the old selector engine, 
and probably just go move to using uh, query selector all. Um, but we wouldn't be able to remove any of the bug fixes that we have to do. Um, so the reality is, is that, um, or I should mention, first of all, even if we removed all the IE specific stuff, it wouldn't get that much faster. Uh, we already optimize the code pretty heavily and make sure that we aren't doing any costly things that we don't have to in other browsers. Um, but it, I mean, obviously the code base would get smaller if we were somehow able to remove all the IE stuff and still have a, a, a functional build of jQuery. Um, so at least for now, it's not really a huge option for us. What was the most requested feature that made it into 1.4? Uh, I would definitely say live events for all events. And I, I know personally I've been working on uh, making Rails more unobtrusive. So we want to make it so that we're not hard coding prototype into Rails. And one of the big blockers for us was having live events work for submit. Um, basically, live events were kind of a curiosity without it being able to work for submit. Uh, what would you highlight as the biggest performance improvement uh, that we're seeing in 1.4? I think probably my um, favorite performance improvement is the improvement to remove an empty. Um, okay, I guess two. Well, one, because rem I, I like to remove an empty one. Well, the, the code before, it was doing something very, very silly, and now it's doing it well. So it's much faster. But remove an empty was used by a lot of other methods, um, like, uh, like HTML, for example. And so optimizing those made HTML a lot faster. Um, I also, but I also, I think probably my favorite is the caching of DOM fragments um, in the HTML uh, creation code. So if you do append, prepend, um, dot HTML, before, after, all that, where you take an HTML fragment um, and you're injecting into the document, uh, what we do is that we check to see if that fragment is getting inserted you know, multiple times in a row. And if that occurs, we start caching, um, we start caching that, that fragment that's generated, and we just, we were able to just clone that fragment as opposed to generating it again and again. And that provided a huge speed up for us. You can see in the numbers that like append, prepend, and all that got much faster. Um, so I think, I think that's probably my favorite uh, because that's a huge benefit of using uh, document fragments. What, um, along with that kind of, uh, we have a question from Max Burnt in Germany. And he's asking, uh, how did you manage to go about improving jQuery 1.4's performance so dramatically? Like, what was your workflow, I guess? Um, so I discussed this very briefly in the release notes, but I, uh, I provided the link to a blog post where I talked about it a little bit more. I also talked about it in a recent talk that I gave uh, at Yahoo. Um, y if you search a little bit, y I talk a little bit about uh, performance analysis. But the, the short of it is, is that instead of analyzing wall clock time, so sit, instead of sitting down and saying, all right, this method takes, you know, four milliseconds to run, let's try and get it down to two. Uh, or, or saying that, you know, uh, you know, this thing looks slow, let's try and improve it. What we did is um, went through and looked at how many function calls there were. So like, for example, if we do add class, and add class, uh, do add class on 100 elements, and there are 600 function calls. That means there are six function calls for each element uh, that we want to add a class to. So that might be okay. That might be something we want, might want to optimize. Now, that's not really indicative of performance per se, but it does imply that there is some level of complexity there. So reducing that complexity, reducing the number of function calls, generally yields performance gains. So what I did was is I, I built a tool uh, to ex automatically extract this information uh, of the function call information out. And I was able to find stuff like the empty and remove were really just not performant at all. They were not optimized. And, um, but other ones that I was able to make some pretty big gains on. And you can see um, it's in the first chart in the release notes where they have these massive uh, bars, sort of like one, three, two, the number of function calls, and then like one, four is this tiny little sliver. And that's the sort of thing that um, was uh, was really worked well. So optimizing function calls uh, yielded just great uh, actual performance benefits. Uh, let's see. Um, so one of the uh, 
one of the new um, methods that we have in, in 1.4 is the, the proxy method. Um, so Alex from Austin is asking, uh, can you explain some common uses of proxy? Um, it looks cool, but I don't know when to use it, he says. That's Alex Sexton of the jQuery podcast, yes. Um, so the, the proxy method is essentially the function that prototype dot bind that's coming in ECMAScript, but the the main use for it is with event bindings. If you have an object that contains the methods that you want to run, and that object's maintaining state for for some element, um, so you know if you've got like a a dialog and you know you you have some object that references the element that the dialog is created from, and it's maintaining state for whether it's open or closed and um, you want to bind a function so that when you click on the close button, you call the close method on that dialog object. Um, if you tried to pass the the dialog object's close function to the click event, uh, the context would be the DOM element instead of the J the dialog object. So it it wouldn't work properly because anytime you reference this, you, you'd be referencing the wrong element. Um, so by proxying the object's close function, um, it, when that function, when that event is triggered, so when the user clicks on the close button, instead of calling the close function with the, the context of that DOM element, it would call it with the context of whatever you proxied it for. Um, so if you proxy it to the object itself, then the context will, will be correct and it'll work fine. Um, you'll, see, uh, you'll, you'll see people handling this perfectly fine for the past couple of years by just creating closures. And so they'll do something like var self equals this or var that equals this. And then they'll bind their function um, with just an anonymous function that calls into the objects function using call or apply. Uh, and the only difference is that with the proxy function, um, you can then unbind it using the original function as a reference which you couldn't do if you created an anonymous function because when you go to unbind it again, you won't have the function that you actually pass to the bind call. Um, so that's really the, the big advantage that it gives you is being able to unbind by the function as opposed to just by the event name. I would say the, the short version is just that if you have existing functions that are part of an object, so there's functions that are part of an object and they have this in them because you've, writ you've written an object, so it's just a method and it's doing stuff with this and you want to pass that as a callback, uh, you need this to be the right thing. So by using dollar dot proxy, you can you can make sure that it's the right thing, and you can still take a function that's attached to some object and use it as a callback. Um, while we're talking about uh, events, um, we had a few people in in the IRC room, uh, IRC channel, ask uh, about live um, some the new events and uh, focus in and focus out. And I know we were discussing this earlier, so. Um, I guess people are, are asking about wh what's up with these new meth with these new events and um, yeah. So specifically about focus in and focus out. Yes. Okay. So uh, the bit of trickiness here, um, and this was brought up on the jQuery Dev mailing list a couple weeks ago by I want to say Alexander, I think that was that was his name, um, where because we were discussing uh, implementing focus and blur live focus and blur. Um, and the, the way the live events work is that it's, it's a form of event delegation. We, we look for an event to occur, which bubbles up the DOM tree, and we capture that, and then we interpret it um, and turn it into a live event. Um, the problem is, is that focus and blur do not bubble. They don't bubble in any browser. Um, and so we, we had two options. One was we could make focus and blur bubble. Um, but that would be kind of deceptive, especially since Focus and Blur have never bubbled. Um, and it's actually in, in the, the W3 DOM event spec says right. that those do events not do not bubble. Yeah. So um, what we opted for that uh, instead was um, uh, Internet Explorer has these focus in and focus out events. Uh, other browsers have a similar event, which is DOM focus in, DOM focus out, but we like the shorter name better. Um, so in that case, what we do is we implement um, uh, uh, these, this new focus in and focus out method, and this and that works um, from elements that aren't uh, uh, immediately receiving the focus. So if you bind a focus in to a form element, for example, you can now find when um, 
whenever a focus occurs on any input. Um, and, and thus, we can use it from live. So now you can do live focus in, and that'll let you know when a focus is occurring anywhere on the page. Um, one point that we discussed today, and what we're probably going to implement really soon here, in either 141 or 142, is make it so that if you do live focus or live blur, we just map that to focus in and focus out. So that way you, just, you don't even have to think about it. You can just keep doing uh, focus and blur. Um, so we have, we have a few questions that are um, B, B. Puddle from Maine asks, do you feel like you were able to accomplish all the goals you had originally set out for the 1.4 release? Um, and then we had another question of if you had another week, uh, what would you have liked to fit in? Um, I, think, I think we got, I think, I think this was a really good release. Um, there's uh, one thing that I wish... Yeah, one thing I, w I wish I could have landed that I've been working on was the new uh, jQuery require method, um, and that's a, a piece of functionality for dynamically loading uh, scripts. Um, especially, uh, 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 this is different from get script in that it, it had some mechanism for figuring out uh, dependencies and being able to load um, scripts uh, both b load scripts asynchronously, but s uh, still block. Uh, execution, and um, so I talked with um, uh, quite a few people about the implementation. And there are many other implementations out there that are similar in some ways, and some are different. It's it, it's it's quite a minefield out there. But um, at least in talking with people, um, I came sort of came to the conclusion that I wanted to think about the problem more, and I wanted to make sure that we were shipping a solution that was actually both good and that would be useful to everyone. Um, so at least in that way, um, I, I want to hold that off for the time being. I, I probably want to release it as a plugin first, just so that uh, we can get more feedback, and, and then uh, and then maybe ship it. Um, but at least for now, uh, I think that uh, I think that's the only thing I think of that got uh, that I wanted to land that just did not make it. Um, I th but I mean, one of our big goals for 1.4 was that we wanted to have, uh, we wanted to do a lot of rewriting, and we did. We rewrote a lot of the code base, and especially bringing the code base up to um, our sort of the, the new core style guidelines that we have. And so that was, that was a lot of work, and unfortunately it's not work that you immediately see, because it it's not represented in API, but it's um, internal code quality. And so, we're, uh, at the very least, I'm very pleased that we were able to get that done. Uh, I'd also say that at one, I actually hadn't worked on jQuery in a while, and I came back uh, to start working, and I went to the 1.4 um, roadmap, and it looked crazy when I first looked at it, um, to the point where it was like, this actually is obviously like the 1.4, 1.5, and 1.6 roadmap. Uh, and, and if you look at the release notes today, you see that pretty much all of it got done. There were some things that just that were like one line item, like make live events work for everything. That turned out to be this like monster rat hole of craziness um, that also involved big internal rewrites. And then there's stuff like make every setter take functions that just involved a lot of uh, making things that making sure things made sense and undergone went some rewrites. And uh, the bottom line though is that I think. I think the opposite of the question is actually true. The question is like, is there anything you, you know, it seems like, it's, it, what would you do if you had another week? I think this release is long overdue. There's like, it's basically like the next three releases in one release. Yeah, I, I also agree that this is long overdue. It's, it's, it's been like 11 months since the last release, which is way too long. Um, I, I can tell, tell you for a fact, the next release is gonna be within the week. Um, uh, because we're getting one for one out uh, right away, and you know to fix any weirdness that may have uh, snuck through, um, and I'm probably going to do a one for two um, either by the end of the month or very early February. And my my personal goal is I want to keep up a rapid pace of uh, a point release per month. Uh, I think that's a probably about a good sweet spot there um, or maybe even uh, dropping back to every other month or so but I, I keeping it uh, just a, a, the last 11 months is just, is just, was just way too long uh, we need to do more um, Alex from Austin asks uh, how is the switch f how has the switch to git 
uh, for source control facilitated any change in the quality or quantity of development on the project? Um, it's been awesome. <laughs> we were, uh, I'm, I'm personally I'm a huge fan of the, the switch to Git and GitHub. Um, more so GitHub than Git. Um, uh, some because that it's, um, it's, it's just been really liberating and getting a lot of contributions from people who've never contributed before. Um, um, so the, the nice thing about GitHub is that they provide, um, they just they make it really easy for people to create their own copies of jQuery, um, and they can make their couple little changes. Uh, it makes it really easy for us to see those changes and then immediately integrate them back into jQuery. Um, GitHub's fork queue um, is awesome. It's it's changed the way that I do development, and um, you know, I can't say enough good things about it. I'm I'm personally planning on developing a number of tools centered around um, sort of our development workflow uh, that we're sort of honing here. Um, and definitely hope to release some things here probably within the up, uh, upcoming months that make just contributing to jQuery even that much easier. And uh, along the same lines, we're planning on moving jQuery UI over to GitHub uh, probably this weekend if we can. It's huge. Um, we got a few questions uh, asking about mobile, um, and this is something that was brought up at the jQuery conference. Um, so I guess w what is the status of of uh, jQuery for mobile or a more modular jQuery or something like that? Um, so another big part about the, um, this uh, of jQuery 1.4 and a lot of the rewriting that we did is making sure that jQuery worked in a um, modular fashion in that, um, or just in a more modular fashion. We're not completely modular right now. Um, but just making sure that... Um, functionality was separated in a good way because as we m move towards building a good mobile javascript library uh there's a lot of work that has to be done and so th i consider this to be a top priority i want um jquery to be not only the best um desktop javascript library but the best mobile javascript library as well and to achieve that goal uh, we uh, have to do a couple things. First, um, we have to make sure that jQuery itself, uh, just regular jQuery, uh, works well on mobile devices. And to do that, we have to test on mobile devices. Um, so recently, we've started to work with mobile manufacturers and collect devices, um, and we're starting to test against them. Um, a big thing um, that I want to shoot for I want to tentatively say by you know, the end of February or so, uh, I want to have a, a series of mobile devices actively integrated into our testing workflow so that every single commit that's coming through is getting run on, on actual mobile devices and we can verify that it, they are still working or, or a build broke or, or so, some such. Um, so that's the first step uh, is uh, setting up, uh, figuring out what mobile browsers we want to support and then making sure jQuery works with them. The second step is s determining um, what exactly a mobile-specific build of jQuery would look like. Uh, because if we want to ship, if, if well, all the problems that exist on the desktop are just amplified on mobile. You know, a network is more of a concern, file size is more of a concern, memory usage is more of a concern, etc. And um, so we really need to buckle down and figure out how do we want do you know, how can we ship a more optimized jQuery, uh, and if it if it is possible, uh, what is the best way to, to to tackle it? So that is something that we're uh, actively uh, going to be working on uh, now. Now that one one point four is out, uh, I'm really excited about it, and I'm I can't wait to uh, get it all going. Cool. Uh, Wavedid in Wisconsin asks uh, asks you to talk a little bit about jQuery support for cross-domain AJAX requests. So this would be cross-domain XHR that's supported in those browsers that support it. Um, so some modern browsers are starting to support cross-domain XML HTTP requests. And 
the way it, it works is it uses the this W3C spec called access control. And it's able to request files uh, on remote domains if you have the, the remote domain configured in such a manner. Um, usually it's either a header or a config file or some such. And what's the nice about it though is that on the client side and the library side, we really don't have to change a whole lot. Um, we had we uh, what we ended up doing is we had to, had to make a couple of tweaks to make sure that everything would go smoothly. But on the whole, um, uh, most of the changes are, are the server side. So like one change that we made that we mentioned in release notes, it was avoiding uh, this thing called pre-flighting. And pre-flighting is when uh, you try to do a post to a, re a remote domain. Um, what what happens is when you do that, it actually um, when you try to do a post to remote domain, it will go and actually do. I think it does a get request first or a head request. It does it does some lesser request first, essentially asking the server is is what I'm about to do okay, and then if the server says yes, it'll respond with um it, it it'll respond and then you can now do the repost request. Um, so the the trick is is that we, you want to try and avoid that pre flooding if possible. Um, and one way to avoid the pre or one way that pre flooding is triggered is if you set a custom header um, on a, uh, an XHR request. Wait, not just not just XHR. And uh, and so one thing that we did is we disable any custom headers that we set uh, that jQuery sets. Um, if you do uh, a remote request like that, um, and that so that'll re avoid that pre-flighting step. Uh, so I d if you're interested in this, I definitely ch recommend checking out, searching for um, cross-domain XHR um, and uh, the W3C access control. Cool. Yeah, as John said, there's a lot more server-side going on, and I, I know that we, like Rails is going to be trying to find ways to make it really easy to say, like, I have a URL, so this URL is valid basically to, to opt into that access control spec. And prob I would recommend if you're interested in W3C access control and how it would work with jQuery to look at whatever server side you're using for specific articles or built-in support for this sort of thing. Because it's not, it's like John said, the client side is the easy part. The hard part is making it so that if you have dynamic content that it's doing the right uh, negotiation. Do um do we expect to see any uh, WebSocket support in jQuery? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it's um, I don't think it makes explicit sense for jQuery core, especially considering that um, a tiny, tiny fraction of the browsers we support actually support WebSockets. Um, sounds like an awesome plugin. Yeah. Um, okay, Scott, uh, some questions for you, I guess. Um, People are curious on when we're going to see corresponding updates for jQuery UI and uh, what, it, what sort of compatibility do we have um, right now? Um, so we're planning jQuery UI 1.8 final for the 28th, which will be the 14th day of the 14 days. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, w we plan on shipping it with jQuery 1.4 or 1.4.1 or 1.4.2. Or um, whatever is available, but it will be fully compatible with 1.3.2. Um, I, I did see there was a question s someone posted, it's probably pretty low down right now, um, about jQuery UI tabs in 1.7.2 not working with 1.4. Uh, we fixed that issue probably about a month or so ago. Um, so when 1.8 ships, that will definitely work. Um, Should people expect 1.7 to be working with 1.4? So we, we we probably won't update one seven to work with one four unless for some unknown reason people are actually not able to upgrade to one four, um, which we're not expecting. So 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 the issue that happened here with uh, the Ajax tabs is that the um, the tabs plugin was using jQuery data and expecting the ID to be returned. If you know, that's yeah. one of the things that was mentioned in the backwards incompatibility. It was expecting an ID to be returned, and it was using that ID for uh, determining um, uh, the tab numbers. Um, and since we now return the object instead. 
Um, so if you upgrade to 1.4 and you want to use jQuery UI 1.7, um, just throw in the jQuery uh, Compat plugin, the one that was released along with, um, uh, if you look at the backwards incompatibility list, just look for that compatibility plugin, include that, and it should, it should work just fine. Yeah, and if there are features like that that, you know, we're getting lots of requests because for some reason people can't upgrade to 1.8, um, then we can release jQuery UI 1.7.3, you know, almost immediately with those bug fixes. I, w I would imagine it's pretty easy since there aren't that many backwards incompatibilities. Yeah. Um, we have a few co questions coming from the uh, IRC channel uh, asking about... Um, uh, jQuery and Microsoft uh, is Microsoft ready to adapt um, adopt jQuery 1.4? Is it is it planning to include it in uh, Visual Studio uh, 2010 release? Yep, I've chatted with those uh, with the team over there, and they are ready to ship 1.4. Uh, I think they're going to be ho they're holding off until we ship 1.4.1, just so that we're super sure that we have the major kinks worked out. Uh, but yeah, they're absolutely going to be shipping 1.4. Uh, um, all right, uh, a question um, kind of outside the scope of, of, of jQuery. Um, are there any projects uh, beyond jQuery and jQuery things that have caught your eye recently? Maybe as inspiration, maybe you just think it's s awesome. You give me a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> So at least um, I've gotten some inspiration lately from uh, going back to what I was discussing earlier with, uh, with GitHub. So both GitHub and uh, the Mozilla project Bespin uh, have captured my imagination. And uh, one thing that I would really like to see, and one thing I hope to be working on here, is for, oh, and for those who aren't familiar with it, Bespin is um, it's a web it's a browser-based IDE. Like you have like a full uh, file view and then a, a, the, your code view. It's, it's really quite neat. Um, one thing I want to be able to do is I want to remove the need for any sort of revision control from most people's workflow. So like for example, if someone finds a bug with jQuery and they go to the bug tracker, um, I want there to be a button that says, I want to help fix this bug. They click it, op pups, the full Bespin IDE with a full checkout of jQuery live right there. They can edit their, you know, they can make their changes, you know, do whatever they need to do. And whenever they're done, they just say, I'm ready for review. When that button is clicked, it's shipped off to the team. We can look at those changes. We can see what was hap what will happen. And at the same exact time, uh, those changes can be pushed off and we can start to run tests, automated tests against them, and those can be integrated back in. So we can know exactly if, uh, you know, if, if those changes caused any breakage. Um, and we can do the review right there in the browser and see what changed. So the important thing here is that we would be using uh, Git uh, as the back end, but we, the users would never have to touch uh, revision control. They wouldn't have to download Git, install it on their machine, check out jQuery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They th this would be all 100% browser-based. So I think that's something that's something that's really captured my imagination lately, and especially with the technologies. Seeing what what GitHub has been possible, uh, what what GitHub has made possible, has really inspired me to try and do even better. It looks like the video dropped. The video dropped. The video dropped. And it's back. Okay. If people hit refresh, apparently. All right. Uh, I think uh, we had a little hiccup there, but it looks like uh, things are back. Okay, rocking. Um, we have a question from uh, Cruxt in Boston, and he asks something that I often think about. Um, are you going to eventually write a good practices coding style guide? Uh, I'm tired of seeing poorly structured jQuery code from third parties. <laughs> um, so th there's there's been plenty of talks and and articles written about this, and you know some some questions to common 
some answers to common questions in the FAQ somewhere on the doc site. Um, I, I'm not really sure that documentation is the problem here. Um, <laughs> the, right, I mean, you can look at existing plugins. Um, there, there are some really well-written plugins that are really popular that aren't that big. Um, and there's, there's tons of articles written. I'm sure we could probably find some, some articles that the team thinks are, are really good at, at capturing what the best practices are and maybe link to them from, from an FAQ or something. Um, but, but if, if, I mean, if you're using plugins that are poorly written, uh, you should be a good community member and just, so, you know, supply some patches, try to improve it yourself. I would also say that there's a, it's a generally hard problem. Um, because J JavaScript itself is a pretty flexible language and there's, I think, different sizes of projects and, and the orthogonal concern of the domain of what you're working on uh, makes the sort of the right practices for JavaScript coding different. And so we could probably put together something that would work for a lot of people and say, like, here's how you should do it. But the truth is that I've worked on a lot of projects and pretty much every project that I've worked on has had such a different uh, notion of what I was doing with JavaScript that I would not have wanted to start by boxing myself into what I'm allowed to do. That's sort of a nice thing about JavaScript is that you can write oh, f really OO style one day or really evented the next day and a lot of it has to do with what you're trying to build. So I think we probably will end up creating something that works for a lot of people because it's probably a good thing to exist. but. For the people who are here today, I would say that reading the articles, like Scott suggested, and trying to get a sense of what JavaScript can do for different scenarios would be would better serve you. Yeah, and I, I think I'll tack on to that, which is um, definitely looking at, at, at quality plugin code and reading through it. Um, also, getting familiar with the source of jQuery. Um, not only I, you can use it for documentation, um, as an alternative to looking at the documentation, you can look at the source. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of things that can blow your mind from a JavaScript perspective. And you're like, oh, wow, I, I could do that too. So um, definitely that. And I, I think that there is, there is quite a bit of um, opportunity for the community to, to write about their experiences with writing plugins. Um, the, uh, um, also, things like the uh, upcoming uh, Widget Factory from jQuery UI is going to add a lot of power and structure to um, the way that people extend their work with jQuery. So I think that's something that's really exciting. One moment, please. <laughs> We're restarting the broadcast, so right. re refresh. One minute. All right, wait, hang on. I think we're all fine. Apparently. Okay. So anyway, you you this is uh, this is our first time using a uh, uStream for something this large, so it, there's bound to be some weird hiccups here. So, um, let's go ahead. All right. Um, uh, we just have a few more. Um, but one I'll, I'll read is, is, method chaining is a big part of jQuery. Would you consider chaining to be an anti-pattern? Uh, for instance, a query that might retain 200 elements might uh, be chained, all of sorts of things, and, and inside each method call is a each. So um, is, is that something that jQuery developers should avoid? Can you expand on that example a little bit? I'm a little confused I, I, what you're the, the example is is if you have 200 elements in a collection, sure, and then you call bind, and then you call CSS, and then you call hide. Sure. Inside each of those, it's going to be doing an each. That's expensive. Oh. So, I mean, I, I I think that the person who is asking it, JDD in Houston, um, kind of answers his own question, which is, I'm already oh. recognizing that that. If if I want to eke out more performance, um, I could avoid you could avoid those loops. So, um, so yeah, I I mean the, um, I mean the thing yeah. is is that the, the the expensive things when you're working with, uh, when you when you're working with a website and you're using JavaScript, um, the expensive things aren't loops. The expensive things are DOM manipulation, um, always, and. Um, you know, like I, I see like these tips and websites for like making JavaScript 
uh, super fast. And it always starts with like, like, like here's how to unroll your loops. Okay. And like, it's like the stupidest stuff ever. Like, you know, like, like you're going to get like 0. 0.002 milliseconds improvement on your code. But the big problem is like, you know, accessing, you know, properties, uh, you know, DOM properties in, uh, Internet Explorer. You know, you, you have to um, kind of take a step back and make sure that what you're doing in the first place is right. And so that's why I don't really think that what jQuery does uh, is that bad. It, and, and in fact, it, and it, it, you know, it, it, helps to, it helps you to structure your code in such a way that you're doing, in, in general, better development practices. Um, you know, the, uh, the cost of doing uh, an extra loop is infinitesimal uh, compared to, um, l you know, let, let's say, you know, constructing a, a, a massive DOM tree, you know, or, or, you, know, you know, from scratch, which is much more expensive. Um, and those are the sort of things that jQuery does really good at, um, you know, making sure that that code is going to be super fast. I just want to follow up on what John said. A um, couple things. Uh, first of all, what John said about uh, about the last thing is similar to like people who think they can get better performance out of by not writing C and writing assembler instead. Like at some point, like jQuery is actually the amount of optimizations that are in it are much better than you're going to get by hand. Uh, but also the specific example that was given there. Can you scroll it back real quick? Uh, the specific example there is exactly the the right case for what John is saying, where the example is that you have a bunch of elements and you bound and then you did CSS and then you did hide. The expensive things there are not this 200 element loop. The expensive things are binding DOM hand things and doing actual CSS manipulation. So you could use a live handler instead and you can do, uh, and you, instead of CSS, you can add a class, right? And that will actually make your code much faster than trying to f find a way to avoid a loop of 200 things. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess uh, one more, th uh, the last thing, I guess, um, is, is there anything that you'd like to uh, tease the audience with regarding uh, what will be coming uh, in the 14 days of jQuery? Well, I think one thing uh, that's safe to uh, talk about is that uh, we're, uh, well, not only jQuery UI coming at the end, uh, but the, we're definitely going to be launching uh, the new uh, plugins repository. Uh, during the 14 days, um, uh, Mike uh, Hustetler and um, and uh, the Pen2 guys have been working full tilt on that, and it's really uh, we're really quite excited to get that out the door. Um, I think one other thing I'll, I'll tease is that the the new uh, jQuery discussion forum. Um, this has been a long time coming. We're in the final uh, stages of importing the data um, from uh, Google Groups. We're running away from Google Groups like uh, rats from a sinking ship, and we can't wait to uh, get everyone over to a, a decent forum where we can start to uh, converse much more easily. Great, I think we're I think we're good. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, uh, we're going to be here in uh, DC for a couple more days, but definitely look forward to. Uh, many more releases over the next 13 days of the 14 days of jQuery. Um, I hope you're excited for uh, jQuery uh, 1.4 like we are. Um, so if you have, please, if you have any questions, um, uh, feel free to uh, hop on uh, the mailing lists for the time being. Or uh, uh, if you find any problems, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, po post them to the, the dev list. Uh, we also want to take an opportunity to thank uh, all of our sponsors who helped us tremendously uh, getting this uh, getting this out the door. Uh, do we have the full list of sponsors? Um, but I definitely want to thank AOL for letting us use the venue here. Um, and uh, see, we got Netflix. Uh, sorry, Netflix. Uh, 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 Juniper I Jupiter IT, Append to Media Temple, uh, Oxide Fusionary. Manning Publishing, Riley Publishing, and Pack Publishing. Uh, so absolutely, thank you to all of them. And also, uh, please, uh, if you look on the website, there's a little banner uh, for donation, and there's a, a link to it on the jQuery 1.4 site. Um, during this these two weeks, if you donate um, $20 or more, uh, we will get you a free uh, ebook. 
um, we've gotten a number of uh, uh, free ebooks from uh, publishers, and we're going to be uh, passing those out. Um, jQuery is run completely uh, off of donations, um, and so we definitely appreciate uh, anything that you can provide. Um, and we can run uh, events like this and do big releases. So it's really quite exciting. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for joining in and looking forward to seeing you over the next uh, couple weeks.